Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It's, it's great to be back in Ward 3. <laughs> We've done this two years in a row now, so I guess it will be a tradition as long as it continues to be so strongly attended. <laughs> 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 but seriously, I'd like to thank Mr. Nash and Mr. Moore for inviting me back. And um, thank you for demonstrating your interest by showing up tonight. I know that the budget presentation doesn't necessarily, um, isn't the most compelling thing that you could attend um, on a Tuesday night. But so, money is where here. reality lives. That's absolutely true. So I think since we have small numbers here, we should sort of structure this more as a seminar than as a speech. But uh, I have prepared some materials, and I'll go through them with you. Um, you know, the idea of community supporting the schools takes me all the way back to the beginning of my time in Northampton and the first public document that I produced. Um, when a superintendent is entering a district, they have to start by getting the lay of the land. And for me, the lay of the land came out in a trilogy. Uh, the, first, the first part of which was called Superintendent's Entry Findings. And the first part of the superintendent's entry findings was called Community Support for Learning. And the quote that it opens with from one of our school committee members is, there's a lot of optimism and support, frankly, for the schools and the community. Um, and I think that's true. And I want to name that as my text for my sermon on the budget tonight, because I think um, it still is even more true than it was at the beginning. Um, so I think the budget that the school committee has just passed and is now winding its way to city council provides ample reason for optimism in the next year, even more so than there was in this year. I told one of the school committee members while I was preparing the budget that I was swinging for the fences, um, which can be dangerous, but fortunately I didn't strike out or pop it up. I think um, I connected with a budget that really brings a lot of new programming to the district for a very reasonable cost. So you have handouts in front of you, um, and I'd like to direct your attention to page three, which gives the budget overview. Um, there are five overall budget priorities that sort of guided the budget process this year. Increasing opportunity for learning, supporting students' emotional health, putting resources to the highest use, enhancing STEM education, that's science, technology, engineering, and math, and increasing equity, fair pay. Um, and within each of those five areas, there were specific new items of the budget that were introduced this year. Um, and all but one has continued to be supported in the current version of the budget. So just to explain a little bit of what we're looking to do. In the area of increasing learning opportunity, we're planning to open a pre-K satellite with full day options for four-year-olds. The current preschool at Bridge Street is really bursting at the seams. Um, it started several years ago with just over 40 students and now we have over 80 students. Um, so uh, the goal is to split the program into two locations. So one location will be here at Bridge Street and another location will be at Leeds School and we're um, expanding staffing slightly in that program so that we can offer two full, two full classes, which are four sessions at each school. Um, Four-year-olds will have the option of staying on for two sessions, space per, um, you know, limited by space, so that we're able to start providing a full day for four-year-olds, which is a new thing. I think it's very important um, based on the feedback we've gotten from parents that um, in our current model, the less than full day option has them cobbling together different types of um, preschool and daycare experiences. So we think that'll be a, a better value for parents of four-year-olds. We're also looking to provide librarians for the elementary schools. For um, several years, the elementary schools have been staffed solely by ESPs. Um, so we have a proposal to and change volunteers. that. Yes, and volunteers. Um, in fact, we've been in the process of trying to digitize our catalog for over a year now, relying mainly on volunteer support. And just, it can't go as quickly as I think it would if we had a like, professional librarian um, to support the elementary schools. Plus, we've had many discussions about enhancing early literacy. 
You know, one of the things that can really support early literacy is if kids have opportunities to read books that they find interesting and engaging that may not happen to be in the, the classroom library. So we think that um, bringing librarians to the elementary schools will definitely help that. And um, along the lines of literacy, we're looking to establish a high school reading class because we have a small number of students who um, enter high school really without the reading skills to access the content of the, of the curriculum. Um, talking about really one class a day, probably eight to 10 students. Um, many of these are students who've had disrupted um, learning experiences who have either been in multiple districts or may have been out of formal education for long periods of time. And our high school teachers are able to differentiate instruction, um, but they really have a hard time teaching reading. Um, and I say that as someone who is licensed to teach English, there's no course in any of the English teacher preparation that tells you what to do with a child who can't read. Um, so looking to add, a reading class at the high school. Then, in supporting students' emotional health, we want to increase psychological support at the elementary and middle schools. Um, we, those are mainly filling out positions that are currently part-time and look, uh, seeking to make them full-time positions. This is um, to support our district's emphasis on social-emotional learning. Um, we know that for in, in our district, School psychologists are not just diagnosticians or um, individuals who support the special education process. They're really school psychologists who help to intervene with students who are having psychological or emotional distress. And the data that we've collected shows that that's an increasing portion of our population and an increasing need, especially at the elementary and middle school levels. Um, we also want to provide consultative services to Ryan Road School. Um, this year, Ryan Road experienced a very significant uptick in the number of students who have experienced trauma uh, prior to coming to school. And um, it's really to the point where an intervention for individual kids doesn't make sense anymore. It needs to be a school-wide intervention um, because the numbers of students who have been exposed to deprivation or trauma is so high um, that we really think it would be helpful to have a consultant come in and work with the entire staff on creating supports and structures within the school day that can support kids who've had those kinds of experiences. Also, we want to increase counseling support at the middle school, um, continuing on the theme of students presenting with social emotional needs. One of the things that we did in looking at whether or not this was a reasonable um, budget request was look at the number of kids who are receiving counseling services just on IEPs doesn't count kids who are receiving counseling services through Section 504 or kids who are just receiving counseling services without any kind of a plan. And next year's um, sixth grade has more counseling support than next year's seventh and eighth grade put together. Um, so we currently have one counselor at middle school. Based on that kind of an increase in volume, we think we need to have another counselor at middle school. So. The next area is putting resources to highest use. Um, the first uh, initiative, maximizing principal time for instructional leadership, is really an artifact of, or a consequence of the fact that our contracts have no duties for elementary teachers. Um, so elementary ESPs have to supervise recess. And if an elementary ESP is out and can't be replaced, then the principal supervises recess. Um, we collected some data and found that um, every principal at the elementary level is putting significant time on a weekly basis into supervising recess. We had costed it out somewhere around, I think it was 70 or $80,000 of principal time is being chewed up in supervising recesses. Um, so it's not really the best use of their skills or the best use of those tax dollars. So our proposal would be to hire um, recess monitors at a much lower hourly rate than principals who could come in and um, relieve the principals of that. Not that we're going to ban them from the 
playground because a lot of important interactions between <laughs> yes. um, kids and principals can happen out there. But we don't want a principal to feel like they can't schedule something in the middle of the day because they don't know whether or not they'll have to go out to the playground. Um, and then, in a similar way, this is something that was eliminated, I'll talk about that later, but we wanted to provide an ETL, which is a team leader, for the elementary grades. Um, this is someone to, pro to handle the paperwork and uh, other, I guess I would call them ministerial or administrative parts of the special education process. Right now, that duty falls to special educators. Um, this has been a constant um, cry, refrain, whatever you want to call it, in the area of special education. Um, when I was a special ed director, um, this is when Congress used to reauthorize laws. Uh, one of the things we used to ask for as a professional group was, please don't put any paperwork reduction clauses in the new reauthorization, because every paperwork reduction just resulted in more paperwork. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and it's, we'd rather have teachers working with kids than spending their time um, getting notices out, scheduling meetings, um, and so our, our goal was to get a, an ETL or a team leader for them. We have, at the middle school, one of the associate principals basically fulfills that function, and at the high school, there is a team leader, but there really isn't that kind of support at the elementary level. So, then in the area of enhanced STEM education, uh, we wanted to establish two global STEM programs, one for Jackson Street School and one for JFK. A uh, global STEM program involves us partnering with a school from another country and a science agency um, to work on a real project. Um, so when I first became aware of this program, I remember the principal coming to me and said, our kids are pointing the Hubble Space Telescope. You know, not a simulation. They're pointing the telescope. And I, I just think that having that kind of experience for our kids and also putting them in contact with um, students from around the globe would really be helpful because populations are crashing in the global north. and <laughs> The action is going to be in Asia and the southern hemisphere for these students. And I think it's important for them to start building cross-cultural competence. And we chose Jackson Street and JFK um, for well, the reason we chose JFK was to enhance um, the science program they have there, and we thought that it was a good place to begin because all students go to JFK. Jackson Street kind of insisted on coming along um, and was allowed into the grant because the principal there was educated in England and already has a relationship with the school in England, so they were able to um, feel that they could fit that within the grant funding for this or not grant funding, but the district funding for this, about $12,000 program. We also wanted to increase funding for ro the robotics program. That's a partnership we have now with Smith Volk. Um, last year, we partnered with Smith Volk so that students could have access to the um, machining equipment and the materials that um, are able to be crafted at Smith. And Smith made a significant enhancement in their support of the robotics program, and so we wanted to match that after all started in our country tonight. Um, and then finally, in the area of increased equity and fair pay, um, we're in the process of equalizing building-based budgets per, based on a per-pupil formula. Um, I'm not exactly sure uh, what the history of the building-based budgets is, but when you look at it on a per-pupil basis, there are some distortions, which we began working out last year. and probably will continue to work out over a number of years to try to bring schools into better alignment with each other so that students don't have a particular advantage or disadvantage based on which school they choose to attend. I have to um, ask, how does that correlate with one school having more students with trauma and deprivation? Um, when we're looking at this part of the budget, we're just looking at the materials and purchase services component. So that's exclusive of staff. Okay, okay. Um, if a school has more needs and has more staff, the staff portion of the budget is not included in this. Okay. And then finally, we want to extend minimum wage protections to all school employees. Um, we have a small number of employees who I discovered this year were making less than the minimum wage. Um, 
their non-represented employees. Um, and so we wanted to, basically it had to do with cafeteria subs and um, other substitute teachers who are not below minimum wage, but close to being below minimum wage. We wanted to also enhance um, so that they didn't fall behind when the, the wage goes up. So the overall cost of those initiatives is $410,000. $636. Um, additional fixed cost increases were about $1.3 million. So when the superintendent and school committee talk about fixed cost increases, those are things like the negotiated contractual raises, um, your energy costs, your insurance costs, um, other, other parts of the program that you really don't have much discretion in. Um, but rest assured, we did not bring forward a $1.7 million budget for, for the taxpayers. Um, the net cost is actually much lower. That's based on the philosophy we have that if we're going to add programs to the budget, if we're going to try to restore things that have been cut, we want to do it in a sustainable way so that when we get to the first um, financial hiccup, all that doesn't just disappear. And so the thing that guides us in that is the city's 2.75% um, stabilization annual budget increase targets. So we wanted to make everything that we wanted to do fit as best we could under 2.75%. Um, so um, the 1.3 million in fixed costs plus the 410,000 in new programs brings us to about 1.7 million. But um, we had other things, uh, we had other savings that we were able to apply to the budget. Um, first, um, we're projecting to save about $555,000 this year. And actually, if you go to the next page, some of this is um, summarized in the budget summary. Those budget savings were due mainly to staff turnover when Senior staff is replaced by new hires. Typically, they come in at a lower grade or lower step in column. Um, so just even replacing teachers but keeping the same number of teachers can be a savings. Um, also, we had lower energy costs this year, as every homeowner did. And we also had much lower substitute costs this year, um, which I think is, for me, very gratifying because one of the signs of culture and one of the signs of employee morale is are they coming to work? Uh, so we had a savings there of about $90,000. Additionally, um, this is summarized in the third paragraph on page four. Additionally, our school choice, that's students choosing into Northampton from other districts, and the circuit breaker program, which is a special education reimbursement program, netted an additional $200,000 this year. So that's money we'll spend next year. And um, then we reallocated about $240,000 from existing budget sources to new uh, budget sources to come up with the other million we needed over the 275000 that the 2.75% increase um, was. So um, the restructuring involved the elimination of seven ESP positions a little more than one teaching position, a part-time tutoring position, and various other line items um, not affecting individuals or, or layoffs. Um, the restructuring part of this budget is the part that received the most public commentary, mainly because people were concerned with um, positions that would be eliminated. Um, we ended up revising the first proposal based upon public feedback. The main difference was um, we decided to, instead of eliminating all four library ESPs and staffing them with a lot, staffing the four libraries with two librarians and two tech media specialists, um, we decided to keep two of the library, current library ESPs and add two librarians. So now to pay for those two ESPs that we were keeping in the budget, we had to eliminate something else. What we eliminated was the additional ETL that we wanted to bring to the elementary schools. Um, so, um, 
The next several pages in your handout, um, well, first shows the increase in the appropriation. You can see we're asking for exactly 2.75%, $746,000. And then the, the next pages break out the budget by cost center, by function, by DESE reporting code, all the different ways that we are required to report this data. And I guess what I'd like to point out is the first pie graph, um, the portion of that circle that is accounted for by special education, it's about a third of the circle. Um, one of the things that I have discussed with everybody I can is that I think that's another area of the budget where we may have ability in the future to reallocate funds to other programs. But in order to do that, we need to do a better job of taking care of kids so that they don't need um, special education services. So we've invested very um, consciously, I can't say heavily, because we've done it step by step and we probably could do more, but um, I can't say strategically also. <laughs> we've um, invested in providing early intervention supports um, in the early grades for students who are beginning to show difficulty in reading, math, and um, social emotional areas. We have seen a decrease in the total number of students identified as needing special education. I think the um, number is down about 40 students year over year. We haven't seen a big drop off in cost yet, but I think that could come in time. Um, the other thing that I think is useful about our early intervening services is we're trying to provide an intervention for kids in grades kindergarten one, two, or three. And if the intervention doesn't work, then move them on to special ed. Um, so not only do we have a chance to um, possibly turn a kid around and keep him in general education, um, but if we can't and the student needs special education, hopefully we can get him those services earlier where um, the interventions can be more effective and less costly. So are those kids in K through three mainstream? They are regular ed kids. They're not even special ed kids yet. Okay, and so do those kids, do the teachers have extra help when they have kids who need extra resources? So what we do is um, we provide universal screenings in those three areas, mm -hmm. in the beginning and the end of the year. We do some in the middle as well. Um, but basically what we're trying to do is identify kids who are in the general education classroom who are looking like they may be starting to develop a learning problem. Then if kids are screened into the program based on those interventions, they work with either a reading specialist, a math specialist, a psychologist um, on whatever the issue is. Then we make a decision after about 12 weeks, is the child making progress or not? If the progress is good, then the child just remains in regular ed. If the progress is not good, then we start talking about making a referral for special ed. And all that data we collected during the intervention is data we can use to help determine whether or not there's a disability in play. So it's not done in the classroom by the regular ed teacher. It's done with regular ed kids, but by supportive services that are working in small groups with kids outside of the classroom. Yeah, and I, and I think the, 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 the whole thing with special ed is always complicated to talk about because, you know, there's sort of a, at the same time as you, you can look at statistics that indicate that you have over-identification for special ed, then the experience of people who are trying to get special ed services mm -hmm. for their child is that, whoa, there's incredible resistance to, to identifying my child as needing special ed. So how can you have both? And I think um, the, the thing that you're talking about, about actually identifying kids who might become special ed kids before, before their parents are pushing for it, so as to provide services so that in the end, yeah. <laughs> so, in other words, so identifying yeah. people better and more appropriately as opposed to sort of waiting until things have gotten really bad and then, mm -hmm. and then having a tug of war because of money and because of what's appropriate for the kid and doing that. So it's, I don't know, I think the language of over and under identification is really not not actually the best language, I don't think it's appropriate always. And I think that when people talk about over-identification, it's clearly true that what it, what's happening is there are kids who should have been getting better services sooner, 
so that then they don't just sort of, oh well, I've got nothing else to do with them but put them into a special ed program. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's sort of a strange, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what, if there is better language out there, but I think we ought to try and figure something out to, to talk about this, because otherwise it sort of sounds like, you're, wait a minute, but if you're screening and finding kids who need interventions, isn't that increasing your identification? So that, that's yeah. a good point. Um, I, I suppose I default to the language over identification because that's the federal language that right. districts are held accountable to. Right, right. Um, but the way I really think about this, just in layperson's terms, is it's easier to solve problems when they're small than when they're big. And it's mm. trying to solve problems at the earliest possible point. Right, and before they've got all sorts of collateral problems. I and mean, if, yes. if a kid's having trouble learning how to read because they have a learning disability, but you don't address that directly and appropriately at the beginning, then you start to get other issues in terms of behavioral Absolutely. issues and, and motivational issues and things like that that, that are compound your original learning disability. And, and that's why I say, and then that child could very easily end up in, you know, in some sort of, right. sort of like, we don't know what to do with this kid kind of situation. And where every single textbook relies almost exclusively on written language, right. they start to fall behind in all the rest of the subjects that they could learn if the reading barrier wasn't standing in the way. Right. So, point well taken. Um, so, as I've said before, I think it's a really excellent budget. I think it provides a great value for the taxpayers. I think we're getting a lot of new things in for just 2.75%. Um, but wait, there's more. <laughs> what I'm really excited about, um, in addition to those programs, is our ability to increase our stability as best we can over the long term. So I wanted to share these with you. Um, and these with you. So these look very similar. But um, you'll notice one of them is from 2016 and one of them is from 2017. These are um, our best effort to forecast into the future status of what the district may be like. In 2000, and what you need to know about this is we're, we're really looking at um, what you may call reserves. It's the district's um, revolving accounts in special education and circuit breaker. And you're looking at the starting balance. It's the number of the bar above the zero. And then anything below the zero is amount of a shortfall we're projecting in the budget that would have to be taken out of that um, revolving account. And then if you look all the way to the end, you'll see there's like a two colored line underneath the zero. The second darker color is even if we spent all of our money in reserves, what we still wouldn't be able to cover. Um, so last that year... pretty scary. Yes. <laughs> Some people call that a fiscal cliff. Um, last year, when I was making projections to the school committee, I thought that 2017 would start to have some problems, um, but probably not necessarily be noticeable, or they might be... Um, ways to address them. And I thought that in 2018, which would be next year, we'd be dealing with a significant problem. And then in 2019, we could totally abandon <coughs> all fiscal sense and spend every available penny on trying to cover the costs of the current year, and we still wouldn't make it. Um, I revised that projection this year based on um, what we were able to do with budget last year, and I think it's a much better picture. There's still a cliff at some point, um, but there's no problem at all this year. There may be a slight problem next year and the year after. I think there'd be some serious choices in, two, in 2020, um, and 2021 is the year that we're looking at as a disaster. So I think we were able to um, extend the period of stability by hopefully two years by some decisions we made in last year's budget and how we um, spent the money. We're looking again to do that with this year's budget and next year's budget to try to keep pushing that cliff out as far into the future as possible. Um, and I just think that it's important for the voters to know that um, because 
we know that the, the override was not easily won, and we know that um, the promise to the voters on the city side was that we would try to make it last as long as we could, and we're trying to do the same thing on the school side, and we're having some success with that. Um, and there are some other things that might help. Um, like one of the things that might help is the House version of the budget included more money than the governor's version of the budget in Chapter 7. Um, the governor's budget included a whopping $57,000 more to be shared between Northampton Public Schools and Smith in Chapter 70 funds. The um, House Ways and Means budget increased that to about 90, by about 90,000, so it would be, you know, approximately 130 all total. Um, and, you know, here I guess would be my first ask with this. Um, I think it would be a good thing to um, just thank the mayor for his commitment to um, direct any additional funds that come into the budget through the House process or the Senate process or any other processes back to the schools. That's not a requirement. I've known many mayors who wouldn't do that. Um, but his commitment has been to, um, do to direct any additional funds that come into Chapter 70 above the governor's budget back to the schools. Um, so it's not a done deal. The Senate comes next and the Massachusetts budget drama. Um, they will come forward with a budget. They might you know, leave that chapter 70 where the House put it. They might put split the difference with the, the governor's budget. They could do whatever. And then the House and Senate Conference Committee need to work out a, a revised bill um, that can pass both houses. So there could be more changes there. And then at the end, the governor has line item veto power to reduce um, any part of the budget. So there, there are many parts of the process, but I think it's a really, um, getting back to my first point about a community that supports its schools, it's a really strong gesture on the part of the mayor. And um, it, that would be one ask I have for people from this. Um, well, and the other ask is to contact your senator. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I'm going to ask you also to, um, to contact your representative, um, Peter Cocott. There is a bill that's scheduled for a hearing um, this Friday. It's House Bill 4219, Enact Strengthening Public Education in the Commonwealth. Um, at the last annual presentation, I talked about the foundation um, review budget. They have uh, they calculated the underfunding in Chapter 70 to be about $1 billion. Um, that's really all they were empowered to do. They weren't authorized to, to spend any money to make up the difference. I will point out that both the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents and Massachusetts Association of School Committees thinks the real shortfall is more like $2 billion, but $1 billion is better than a kick in the head. Um, this is the first uh, bill I've seen that really makes an effort to try to enact in legislation a commitment um, from the House to fund the deficit that's noted in the Foundation Review Commission. Um, there may be other pieces forthcoming, but this is very timely. And I think it's important for the district and important for moving out this cliff farther. Um, we looked at one simulation which showed what a first year implementation of the Foundation Commission um, findings would be for Northampton. And I think it was an increase of $280,000, um, which you know, isn't an overwhelming amount of money, but it would be enough to say, take care of the problem projected for 2018 or 2019. And that's cumulative over, over time. So as it builds and as your percentage builds on that, um, that would be helpful. Um, so those are, those are sort of the two asks I'll end with, and then just open it up for questions or comments. Well, last year, you know, it took a look at what it would take to have the older schools open later in the day. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's 
continues to be an interest if there's if you've looked at that any more if you plan to do anything about that so last year I calculated the cost was just a little bit more than ninety thousand um, dollars mm -hmm. I would would not want to do it without bringing in new revenues that could cover the ninety thousand um, dollars I have had some initial discussions with um, the high school principal and with some other people about a program that might increase revenue. That could be a potential use for those funds. Um, it could also be potentially used for other things in the high school. Um, the program we're looking at would um, uh, potentially allow us to accept foreign students on a tuition basis to the high school. It's, much, um, it's a much higher tuition than we get through the school choice program. It also, for me, has the moral advantage of not destabilizing neighboring communities in order to um, increase our budget. Um, and, and, and that money has to be and spent. And exposing our students to global. Right, exactly, students. exactly. Um, so, and that money would have to go in a revolving account. It would, ha it would be restricted to only being used for high school purposes. That could be a potential. You know, I'm not saying that's for sure. But um, the, the outcome last year was that I, I think the cutting we would have to get to to get the $90,000 was not, I certainly didn't recommend it as being a worthwhile trade-off, but you know, it's still something people talk about. Um, we would just want to be able to do it in a way that doesn't cause us to have to eliminate or severely cut other programs that also benefit high school kids. I love all the things you're doing. Good things also seems to me that one of the easiest ways to increase our scores based on all the test results I've seen from other places is to have a later start time. I don't think anybody I mean, questions that right. research. It's, you know, the gives to gets. I mean, we want to support the health and well-being of our students. It's just not controversial anymore. Well, it's only controversial when you have to pay for it. Yes, and <laughs> so, because I want to volunteer to, if you have little pieces, you want somebody to research, give me a call. Okay. How can we do this? What, mm -hmm. What's the data on X? I would love to help. Thank that you. Happen. I was going to share, I think the, it was exciting to hear about all the new in, in the five areas that you were mm -hmm. sharing, especially because it doesn't just sound like just increases, but actually new opportunities yeah. rather than just like mm -hmm. building, not just building capacity, but, but expanding opportunities, which is great. Is it the taking off the special educator time for instruction? Is that something that can remain on the table for future budgets kind of thing, like in terms of the planning that was in there? Because that does seem like a needed and exciting, uh, important opportunity for schools. Do, for a family doesn't already have like instructional leadership specialists or math department heads for elementary, does it? Or so there is a math department head for K to 12 and then another math department head for K to 5. I'm sorry, for 6 to 12 and K to 5. Right. Okay. Um, but this, this position is not necessarily instructional either in math or in ELA. This would be a position that has to do with um, special education process, which would hopefully allow special ed teachers to spend more time with kids. So I would like to do it. Um, I, do, I think it's a wise investment in the end. Um, I also think there are certain efficiencies that come, I'll say this as someone who worked as a team leader before, of just doing the same thing all day long. Yeah. Um, it's different than running out in between classes trying to get all kids. And it's a different things. skill set. Yes. And than Possibly being in a class. Th this is common in the medical right. profession. Yeah. <laughs> well. And the, the other thing I was going to ask is, and I mean, if maybe it's all said and done, so it's a moot point, but with this full day option for the four-year-olds, it seemed like you said it was basically to attend the morning and the afternoon. Is there something that can be programmatically set up so that it's actually a full day rather than two half days? I, mean, I know they'll stay the whole day, but is there something possibly in the planning to make it an actual full day like you might see in other programs and what have you. 
The um, vision with that is not to have them just repeat the morning experience in the afternoon, but to have something that's different in the afternoon. Um, the, way, the reason I'm calling it two sessions is because in the morning they might have three-year-olds with them, and then in the afternoon it would be just the four-year-olds. Um, so, again, you know, it would be for them like a full day, but it was the full day in which some of the kids disappear yeah. halfway through the day. I want to express my enthusiasm and excitement about seeing librarians in grade schools. I just, just think that is so important. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just I think the thing that comes through always with regard to the state is, um, you know, the whole promise of education reform was the idea that it was going to make sort of decouple a public education from local property taxes. And then when you look at the, 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 the last 15 years or so, essentially that has gone the other direction. So that, um, we all know costs are in general going up. I mean, we got lucky this year with, you know, cost of heating, but you know, that's not, that's, yeah. that's a dip, that's not a trend. Yeah. And um, so in general costs are going up, but, the, and um, so our, just to do the same exact services, um, which we aren't. We're doing a lot less services than we were 15 or 20 years ago, precisely because costs were going up and revenues were not. Um, so there's been a lot of cutting in the past, but right now you look at it and just, just maintaining the same services, that price continues to go up. State funding has essentially been level for the last decade. And so once again, in order to make up the difference, it's becoming um, property taxes. And in any way, the state funding, if I got this right, what is it, a percent of our budget? Something on the order of 20%? I think that's about right. Is that about right? Yeah. So it's been about 20% starting then, but it's slowly becoming a smaller and smaller percent. Right. It's not even the biggest chunk. So essentially, our whole education is paid for by local property taxes. And any... Um, Increased costs, whether they're the sort of fixed costs that we're contracted for, like, like we, you know, heating our buildings and, um, you know, basic, basically just doing what we do, is going to come from increases in, has to come from increases in, in the local appropriation, until the state does something differently. Mm -hmm. With so, that in mind, though, like, with, so I mean, with this inevitable shortfall. <laughs> I mean, is it, is it on the horizon needing another um, proposition of raising more money? Um, and if that is inevitable, I mean, from my experience from the first one, the most recent one, it was in a hard economic time, so I think that made it a more challenging thing. I mean, is it possible to be proactive? And if, if we're going to ask, might as well ask when times are better than... Mm -hmm. economically worse. I mean, is, is it inevitable that we're going to have to ask for more money from taxpayers? And if so, it seems like strategically maybe when there's good news and better economy is the right time to ask. I don't know. I don't know how that, I mean, that is a, a question I really don't have the political chop to answer. <laughs> um, you know, it, it always seems like, I think this is even biblical, that you're supposed to... Um, save when you have so that you can spend when you don't. Um, but I think politically it seems like we're always requesting money when we're in a crisis situation. I can't tell you when it would come. I can tell you that you know we're trying to be as responsible as we can to push it out as far as possible. But unless the state um, changes its mm -hmm. funding formula dramatically, which the Foundation Commission says it should do, um, I do think a day is coming. Um, probably in the next decade where we're faced with the decision of either having to have another Proposition 2.5 override or having pretty significant cuts to the schools. And I guess also sort of with what you were saying though is um, when we were asking because there was a deficit for more money, um, basically like asking money to keep the status quo sometimes sounds like a harder sell than mm -hmm. asking for money to do something greater. And I mean, it's unimagined you have like a, a dream list and maybe, because then if you ask for money to get the dream list in, then I don't know, I don't know the strategic part of it, but 
it seems like there's a lot more that with all just even this sounds great and it seems like there must be 10 more pages of lists of dreams of what you want to have happen mm -hmm. for the schools and as a parent I'd love to see happen and if uh, it would be sad to see the next time we get asked for money it's because we don't have enough and not because we want to do something more well that I mean that's kind of the philosophy behind the capital budget you know when you put a roof on a building you know it has 40 years or however many years and so if you could save 1 40th of the cost of replacement every year then you'd be ready when it was time to <laughs> replace again you know if, I don't know how you can say okay so we're six or seven years out can we save one seventh of the deficit every year so that we're not faced with that I mean it, it does sound very reasonable I don't know if it's politically feasible <laughs> So you bring up actually my question. I'm not seeing any capital expense in here. Capital is a different part of the budget. This is just the operating budget. Okay, but you have a capital budget. Yes. What happens is every year um, Central Services, which is one of our cost centers, submits um, our capital requests to the city. It goes through a review process and then some of them are acted on immediately, some of them are deferred. Um, some of them are just said, this probably isn't going to happen. Um, so our capital budgets, this, well, the last major capital projects we did last summer involved the replacing the roof at Ryan Road School and replacing the roof at Leeds, a portion of the roof at Leeds. We uh, learned that we probably should have replaced the whole thing because the other half is leaking now. So um, we have um, MSBA um, working with us to see if we could qualify for another project to do the other half of the roof. Um, we're redoing the tennis courts at JFK this summer. Um, but all of those requests kind of work in another part of the budget. Um, they they truly are wish list. Um, you know, we, yeah. we explain what the capital need is and then projects are funded along with all the rest of the city projects based on criteria of importance and um, cost really. There's a really, I don't know if it's, if it's publishing, we have a very, it's a very informative grid with all the various sorts of anticipated capital projects that the city has, and I think they have it going out maybe eight years or something like that. So there's this grid that shows each year, and then the projects sort of, right. sort of as a way to rank them by urgency yes. and sort of, and also by sort of to plan ahead. So the things that don't need to happen now, yeah. but everybody should know um, that in 10 yeah. years there's a, a roof right. that's going to need to be fixed and it's, it's already on the grid and then every year that grid sort of yeah. gets moved I've across. Done. Done that's so anyway, so it's a lovely, it's yeah. a lovely thing to look at and it, it, sometimes it's surprising that the things you see you're sort of like, mm -hmm. is that more important? You know, because there is a whole lot of people, it gets, goes through a process of people doing that going, well, which is more important? The, you know, the parking lot here versus the, you know, <laughs> the roof there. Right. So, uh, several years ago, more than several, maybe, there was a discussion at the state level about allowing towns to have a local option meals tax. Mm -hmm. Whatever happened to that? We have it, don't we? I think we do. We have it? Yeah, I think we have it. And do, are we at the maximum? I have no idea. I'm just Let's get else. David in here. <laughs> we we had local option taxes, and in my city, we dedicated that money to school capital projects, and we promised people, "This is what we're going to spend your money for," and at the end of this period of time, the tax will go away. Of course, figuring we'd re up it mm -hmm. when that came up, but with a new plan that had people would vote on again. And then we had a committee with representatives from every school. Now, the PTA has appointed people and figured out what their buildings, what their own local needs were, put them into a capital improvement plan, and then citywide, we already had all this buy in. Mm -hmm. said, okay, we're going to do this for five years and we're going to pay for these things that we know is needed in our neighborhood. And I just, it worked for a while. Anyway, I don't know whether it's... For me, that just reminds me of how much we depend on um, stuff that's not in our budget. Um, 
for the kinds of things that individual schools decide that they really need, they fund it themselves. The PTOs mm -hmm. have funded the, all the playgrounds recently that I'm aware of. Um, but you can't fund a new roof. Or no, you can't. But 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 like but, a, but a tremendous it's amount of stuff, a tremendous amount of the sorts of things that have been funded through PTO. So we're really that's another another hidden part of this that the that we're also resting on, which in addition to it not being the state's commitment really not keeping up with well, with their money not keeping up with their commitment. Um, part of how we're compensating for that has been not only with the increase in property taxes with the last override, but also with PTOs and parents actually do a lot because you know, certainly at the high school, well, it even happens at the middle school when we, when, I don't know, it was 20 years ago, they eliminated middle school sports. So then all of a sudden that becomes a thing that parents pay for if their kids are going to participate in organized athletics in the middle school. And at the high school, there's a fee and so on. So there's, you know, and, and so, so, so there's been a lot of externalization but from the city, from the school budget of costs. You just can't count on that. It's not no, right to count no, on it's, that. Well, it's not only. It, it might, but it's where we're at. I mean, I think that's the, it, because when you look at one of these fiscal cliffs, you compromise yeah. those kinds of values. Well, I, you know, I, I think it's great the, the work that you've done in school committee and yeah. city as a whole. Yes. I mean, that yes. the, um, when we initially pushed through that override, it was going to be like this year or next year that it would be running out. And we're, you know, by being responsible and good stewards of mm -hmm. taxpayer money that... And creative. And being creative and putting services at the schools where they're needed rather than creating a whole program like mm -hmm. the, if the student needs reading supports. Mm -hmm. um, so. This is this is great. I want to thank you and school committee for all of your work. Thank you. Amen.